Welcome to the Living While Loving Your Child Through Addiction podcast, formerly known as Living With Your Child's Addiction. Here, we focus on self-care as we tend to our own lives while also extending love and compassion to our kids. This podcast also offers science-backed skills to bring hope and healing to your entire family. This episode is going to serve as the first episode of season three and will also be added to episode number one because listeners who find this podcast and listen in order need to be prepared for the twists and turns and tragedy that occurs as this podcast chronicles my journey along with my daughter, Helena's. When I started this podcast in December of 2020, I had gone through a divorce, moved from Oklahoma to Florida to live near my mother and sister in March of 2020. And my daughter, Helena, had stayed in Oklahoma. She couldn't come with me because of her addiction. There was just no way that she could leave that area until she was ready for recovery. So after five really hard months of living away from my daughter, which I think I went to see her two or three times during those five months, she called me and asked me to take her to treatment. And what's critical about that is what happened before that day that she decided that she was ready for treatment. I think it's important to share because it's different than the story we normally hear. So she'd been living with this boyfriend who had this really cute little apartment. It was in a very safe neighborhood. And it was the first time that Helena had lived somewhere safe and clean in a really long time since she had moved out basically when she turned 18. And the boyfriend, he was taking care of her financially. He was buying her drugs. And I don't say that to villainize or blame him. At this point, I was well past blame. I'm just laying the groundwork for the story. But at the time, I was afraid that with a steady supply of money and drugs, that there's no way that she would ever go to treatment. And on one hand, I wanted her to have a safe place to stay and a higher quality of life than she had had up until that point. But on the other hand, there were these lingering stigmatized beliefs that she would never choose recovery if she was too comfortable. And that made me really sad because I believe that ultimately that situation would keep her from getting help. But ironically, living in a clean, safe place felt good to her. Being loved and cared for by her boyfriend also felt good to her. Not having to do things she was disgusted by to get money and drugs felt good to her. I'm not judging her when I use the word disgusted, by the way. That's her word about how she felt. So living that way with the boyfriend in this better environment gave her hope for a better life. So her and her boyfriend break up. And she can't stand the thought of going back to the way she was living before. So she goes to treatment. And that reminds me of how a safe consumption site works. There's the utility of the service and the harm reduction, but there's also the byproduct of people being treated with kindness and respect and humanity that invites positive change, the access to services. It reminds them that there is something worth moving toward, that there is the possibility of a better life. So going back to when Helena called me about going to treatment, she stayed for about 90 days. She got into recovery for 18 months and stayed in recovery most of that time. She was living her life very differently, but also really struggling in the beginning. After that struggle, she had a short return to use, went to treatment again. And that time things really changed. Every time I saw Helena, the light inside of this kid was just glowing more and more. And she was finding her way as a young woman in recovery. It was an absolutely incredible time 
of great joy for me to get to really connect with my daughter in a way that she had not been available to connect with me in years. But the tragic part is that recovery is not a straight line. And things are different today with fentanyl. Alana had a reoccurrence of use and got a deadly dose of fentanyl and passed away. There's just no easy way to work that into an episode of a podcast that's about family recovery. But it felt important to me to add that into this episode that is serving as first episode of season three and also part of season or episode number one, because I don't want listeners who don't know my story to find the podcast, start listening in order, then be on this emotional healing journey and recovery journey only then to hear about her passing away in the beginning of season two after just hearing her be interviewed twice. I think it's only fair to be upfront about how things turned out with her. So what I think is really important to add to this part of my story, because I really think it's critical is that most people would think that this is the worst case scenario, but it is not. My daughter and I had repaired our relationship several years before she passed away. I was so proud of myself and the work that I did to learn about substance use disorder, the work that I did on myself. And I am especially proud of the mom that I became as I implemented everything that I learned. Like I got to become the mom that I always wanted to be, but just couldn't quite get there before. My daughter knew, and she told me she knew that she was loved and supported unconditionally by me. So the true worst case scenario would have been if we hadn't had the chance to repair our relationship, or if I wasn't proud of myself as her mom before she passed. And to me, that's the beauty of family recovery. When we show up and take responsibility for our emotions and actions and our experience of our kids' addiction, we get to be proud of ourselves and proud of how we showed up no matter what happens. Because ultimately, our outcome and how we show up is the one thing that we're completely in control of. We can create the best possible conditions for our kids to want to change, but we can't control their outcomes. We can only control ours. So as you listen to this podcast, think about what you can take away from it and implement to make you proud of yourself as a parent. And sorry for the noise there, but I am not going to record this podcast again in order to get that noise out of the background. But if you weren't listening, it probably got your attention. (laughs) So again, as you're listening, I want you to think about what you can take away from this podcast and implement to make you proud as a parent. And something that you might consider is how your actions are impacted by stigma. That's something that has been just an ongoing change process for me. And what you're going to notice as you're listening from the beginning to now is that my language changes as I learned the impact of stigma and saw ways that I was still affected by it. I unintentionally used some stigmatizing language at times. I tiptoed around how I felt about tough love, but I think it's important for me to share how I feel about tough love without watering it down and just to acknowledge that change and what a process it is to see how we're affected by stigma because what makes it so hard to see is because it's a huge part of our culture. We're surrounded by it all the time. It's in movies and TV shows and advertisements and the news and even recovery programs. So it's nearly impossible to identify without a lot of work and education. And it's an ongoing process. 
So there were just so many stigmas that were so deeply ingrained in my belief system that I hadn't even identified them yet. And I'm I'm sure that there's more there. And a year from now, I'll probably cringe about something I just said in this episode. So there were words that I used like substance abuse, codependent, rock bottom, not wanting to make my daughter too comfortable. And those are all things that I feel completely differently about now. When Helena passed away, I got her journal like a month later and it just immediately like washed over me things that I had held back from doing for her because I was afraid of harming her by doing too much for her. Yet I have never once regretted helping. And Yet I have to forgive myself for the things that I didn't do or the things that I did because of tough love. And the term rock bottom, it is particularly bothersome to me. I don't deny that there's a point at which people who struggle with substances make change, but I prefer to call it a turning point because I can't think of any other situation in life where we use such despair-inducing language to describe a person's change process. The thought of rock bottom absolutely terrified me. Like, how could things get any worse when my daughter was already barely recognizable? She went from having this most beautiful long blonde hair all the way down her back. She ended up shaving her head. She had scars all over her arms from self-harm, sores on her face that were bleeding. She was so skinny that her size three pants were hanging off her five foot 10 frame. Like she had hardly any clothes left. She broken the law, done things that neither of us could have ever imagined, was houseless at times. Just all these things, like it made me desperate to think what else is going to, what's this rock bottom hellscape going to look like if we're not there yet? But the truth is that people change and are motivated to change for different reasons. And as long as I had that thought process about rock bottom, it was affecting the way I showed up as a mom. But then I heard this term, raising the bottom. And I liked that term better than rock bottom because it created this image in my mind of a floor rising up to meet somebody who's falling. And if a person only has to fall a couple of feet versus falling off a cliff, well, that was easier for me to handle. But it was still too close to that rock bottom line of thinking. And it, it again, affected my approach to supporting my daughter. So I stopped using my, that term as well. Another term I stopped using was codependent. Like when we pathologize parents and basically ourselves by calling us, referring to ourselves as codependent, I think it's unfair because When we're deeply concerned and involved in our kid's life because of their addiction, we're labeled as codependent. But if we had a child struggling with cancer and we were doing exactly the same things, we would be called loving and supportive. And that double standard isn't fair. And it fails to recognize that this is a life-threatening condition. And that our actions come from a place of love and a desire to help our kids, just as we would if they were facing any other illness. So when we just tell parents, stop being codependent, stop enabling, we aren't helping them. We're just criticizing them. So what if instead, which is the whole point of this podcast, is offering these nuanced skills that they can you can add to your approach. So instead of calling you codependent for solving your child's problems, which I would never do to a client or anybody else I was talking to, I would instead say, how about trying reflective listening the next time? How does that feel as you reflect what they're saying back to them 
So they get the opportunity to think through solving the problem and you don't feel the pressure of solving the problem. Or if they're giving their child cash and they don't want to do it anymore, instead of telling them, you know, stop being an enabler, we would talk about things that they could do instead, like giving them food and and necessities instead of cash, right? We're giving a replacement skill instead of telling them to just stop doing what they're doing because then what do you do? Like you need skills to get through this. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up this episode right here because I need to keep it short because this is going to be added to episode number one. And if it's too long, nobody will listen to episode number one. But I just want to say, I am so glad to be back podcasting. I really miss the connection when I take a break from podcasting. And I've heard from so many of you that you've missed it too. So I am so excited to spend season three helping you love your child through addiction. And if you're listening to this as episode number one, keep listening because episode, the original number one is coming right up.